You're listening to Discovery, a podcast presented by the University of Washington School of Law. Welcome to Discovery, a University of Washington School of Law podcast where we dive into today's biggest legal topics with the law school's distinguished guests and experts from around the world. I'm John Blumster, and today we welcome on Liz Frost, partner at global law firm Perkins Coie. Liz is a renowned attorney with a wealth of experience representing voters, campaigns, political committees, and others with an interest in political process in litigation. She has successfully litigated cases involving redistricting, voting rights, and campaign finance, as well as those implicating important matters of First Amendment speech and association. Most recently, she served as the, quote, chief lieutenant and air traffic control for Perkins Coie's political litigation teams working in the 2020 election cycle. And she recently joined the law school for a special panel event to discuss the 2021 presidential transition, how the rule of law broke down, and the role of lawyers must play in safeguarding American democracy in the immediate fight against voter suppression. We are thrilled to have her on to talk about all of this. So let's get into it. Liz, thank you very much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here, uh, not least of all because I'm a graduate of the UW School of Law, 2007, and it's great to be back talking Absolutely. to you. Absolutely. Well, we're really happy to, to welcome you back. First of all, can you just tell us a little bit about the work that you do at uh, Perkins Coie? Yeah, absolutely. So Perkins Coie has the oldest political law department in the country. It was founded in the 1980s by an attorney named Bob Bauer, who would later go on to be the uh, White House counsel for Barack Obama, and who actually uh, just also served in the campaign for President Biden. Over the years, it has evolved. Some lawyers in our practice do a lot of advising campaigns. We do a lot of campaign finance work. But my piece of the practice is specializes in litigation that involves the political practice. And this practice actually evolved out of we were recount lawyers first. So we do um, a lot of, we've done a lot of recounts. We're probably most well known for the Al Franken recount, which lasted many, many, many months. Our lawyers uh, basically moved to Minnesota for that. And we've done recounts kind of big and small since then. In that process, it became very clear to us that there were a lot of laws that may seem kind of innocuous on their face, but that were disenfranchising lawful voters in the thousands. In Washington state, actually, a vote by mail state signature match is an issue. But there's lots of different laws that when you see, when you get to see ballots in a close election being reviewed, you see where voters make totally innocent errors and their ballots get tossed. So that actually started to drive what we're now really well known for, which is our voting rights work. And the voting rights cases that we bring sometimes challenge laws that are clearly on their face problematic for lawful voters. And sometimes they challenge some of these these kind of more technical seeming laws, but that actually can make a big difference. Uh, And then the other kind of work we do is obviously redistricting work. One of the first cases I worked with in the practice was a challenge to Florida's redistricting congressional map under a new state constitutional amendment that they had that made partisan redistricting unconstitutional. Redistricting cases tend to last several years, um, but they're fascinating cases. And in the, in the end, we got a declaration that the map was in fact unconstitutional and Florida had to redraw its congressional map to make it more fair. How did the pandemic affect the focus of your work this past year? So we came into, it, it impacted it a lot in, in interesting ways. One of the things about my work is it's never boring and you never know what's coming around the corner. And 2020 was that on steroids. So we started the year thinking that what we were going to do was challenge, you know, a, a series of voting laws uh, of the type that we kind of normally challenge. Ones that, you know, on their face are either very problematic for access to the ballot for voters and particularly voters in communities that have tend to had had more obstacles erected to to their being able to cast their votes. And we were sitting down, we were preparing for that. And then, of course, the pandemic hit and our focus immediately shifted. Well, I guess maybe not shifted. It sharpened, I think is probably the better way to put it, because as I as I mentioned, we already are we're hyper aware because of the redistrict or sorry, we're hyper aware because of the recount work that we've done. 
in the ways in particular that voters can be disenfranchised in voting absentee and mail-in ballots. This is a, a particular kind of voting that all kinds of, there's all kinds of seemingly innocuous hurdles, depending on the state, that can end up getting a ballot tossed. So we, with the pandemic, it obviously became very clear that a lot more voters were going to need to vote by mail. We were very worried that a lot of voters who would be new to voting by mail were more likely to make innocent errors in the process that would result in their vote not being able to count. So we turned our focus to primarily to, to vote by mail issues. And we identified what we call the four pillars of vote by mail, which included signature matching issues. They included prepaying postage for ballots. Actually, Washington State King County did a really interesting experiment with this. And it showed that when you prepay postage on ballots, you get a, a marked improvement in voter turnout. And there were a couple other issues we started to look at. We also, by the way, were looking at, at in-person voting because there are always going to be some voters who are going to need to vote in person or who frankly just don't trust the post office or don't trust their government to count their vote unless they see their ballot go into the ballot box. Now, this was all before we knew what was going to happen with Louis DeJoy and the Postal Service. So we were kind of already laser focused on this. I can tell you a couple of things that surprised us right out of the gate. We didn't expect there to be such a fight, a partisan fight, over access to voting during a pandemic. This is the very first time that the United States has had to hold a presidential election in a pandemic. The 1918 flu actually impacted midterm elections, but never presidential elections. And there's a difference. There's a lot more voters who participate in presidential elections. We anticipated that actually this would be a time that you would start to see even state actors who are normally hesitant to enact voter-friendly laws that would ensure voter access to say, all right, it's a pandemic, let's kind of loosen things a little bit. No, it was a fight from the start. And it very quickly became a fight over things that frankly before 2020 were not issues. They were, they were things that were supported broadly by both parties, such as drop boxes. The fact that drop boxes at some point became publicly, public enemy number one was like a huge surprise. The other thing that we saw pretty early on that was frankly something we'd never seen before was we started to see Trump's campaign and local Republican parties going into states where like a great example of this is New Jersey. New Jersey acted quickly to respond to the pandemic to make sure that their voters would be able to vote. And they passed a couple laws that frankly are not that unusual. They said that Elections officials could start opening ballots, not processing, but opening them a little bit before the election, which is done in almost the majority of states. And it's in order to enable there to not be a lag in counting the ballots afterwards so that you can turn on CNN and someone can tell you who won the election in New Jersey relatively quickly. And they did some other very simple voter friendly measures to make the election go smoothly, not only to help voters, frankly, but also to help elections officials who were just completely underwater in this completely unprecedented situation. The Trump campaign and the New Jersey Republican Party sued in federal court to try and repeal those laws. With the exception of a few ultra right wing kind of fringe organizations, we had never seen attempts to use the judiciary in this way to repeal voting rights. We'd seen state legislatures do it, certainly. It's been a part of the American playbook, frankly, almost since the beginning of the Republic, but we'd never seen campaigns in particular, parties going in to say, let's make it harder for people to vote. The states don't have the right to make it easier for, for their voters to vote, much less in a pandemic. So that told us that something had really changed. We were seeing a monumental shift. And of course, it became clear that it was a part of this larger myth and story that was being sold to the American public. The story that, and the lie that our elections are not secure, that you, you can't trust what's happening, that people are going to be voting who shouldn't be voting. And this has been also, frankly, a voter suppression tactic since the beginning of the Republic, throughout Jim Crow, you hear the same stories about voter fraud. 
And then, you know, over the past decade, when we've started to see, again, kind of a resurgence of these restrictions on, on voting laws, over and over and over again, you hear voter fraud. Over and over and over again, these stories have been debunked. And it is absolutely clear now that voter fraud hardly ever happens. I mean, it, it, is, it is an infinitesimal amount of the ballots that are cast in the United States. The National Republican Lawyers Association spent a ton of time and money trying to find a lot of evidence of voter fraud and came up with very, very few incidences. And on the flip side, what is clear is that these measures that are justified by the voter fraud lie disenfranchise lawful voters in the thousands, sometimes more. So when you're talking about this balancing, you know, it's, it's, this, it's this bloodline that kind of runs through this fight, uh, but it's very clear what's true and what's not. So that's what we saw leading up to the election. Like you're like you were saying, these efforts to disenfranchise voters date back to d- the start of the republic in many ways, and it's really culminating in the extreme examples that that you see now. So specifically, what is some of the groundwork that has been laid that has led up to voter suppression becoming a political strategy for one party? Yeah, I mean, it's a sad, I think it's honestly, it's a sad thing to see as an American. But I think what's happening is you see this happening in particular in locations where the demographics of the of the voting public are changing. Texas is very notorious for any time um, you start to see greater Latino or Black turnout getting, trying to get in front of it a little bit by tweaking their laws to make it a little harder. Georgia as well. Georgia actually had a has had a habit of a t- of redistricting mid cycle. Uh, so what that means is usually redistricting happens every ten years. You actually saw in the past decade the the uh, Georgia legislature redistricting. I think it was in two thousand fifteen about that. After you started to see the suburbs around Atlanta starting to diversify and turn more blue, and they would just move the map just a little bit to get ahead of it. So. I think, you know, that's what you're seeing. I think it's deeply unfortunate that the stories that have had to be told in order to justify what is effectively elected representatives attempting to choose who votes for them so that they can retain their power, I think are culminating in what we saw in 2020. And I think a historical moment we are still living in, which is they really do threaten the very foundation of our republic. We see such a wide range of laws that have been enacted or that lawmakers are seeking to enact to make it harder to vote or to fully disenfranchise voters. But why are the restrictions that make it more difficult to vote almost more dangerous than laws that completely disenfranchise voters altogether? I don't know that I would say they're more dangerous than the laws that disenfranchise voters altogether, but I will say they are both extremely dangerous. I think that one of the reasons that laws that just kind of shave off voters on the edges in some ways are more threatening to the foundation of our democracy is that it can be harder to convince a judge that they are as problematic as we know they are. And, you know, when you have a law that just says these people can't vote, then it's it's very hard for, I think, a court to look at that and say, that's an acceptable law under our constitution, right? That's like the very far end of that. But voter suppression, I mean, since its infancy, has always been extraordinarily creative. This was the, you know, this was true of literacy tests, right? They didn't say Black people can't vote. They said everyone has to pass this test. And then they were given in the discretion of elections officials when voters showed up at the polls to black voters and not to white voters or white voters were, you know, if they were given the test at all, were scored in a more forgiving way. And it's always been that, I mean, this was the reason the Voting Rights Act was enacted and why Section 5 was so important, because it required that the Department of Justice or a federal court determine before the law went into effect, that it wasn't going to have a negative impact on the ability of minorities to vote. Without that, 
you find yourself in front of a court and you say, Your Honor, we know because of the way that these laws behave that this is going to have a negative impact. And the court will say, but you don't have evidence of it because there hasn't been an election under it. So you go into the election and then you, it's like these natural experiments that you have to let play out. And then you get these experts in or they're warring experts. And a lot of these issues can become, they are very nuanced and difficult, right? They're not just pure questions of pure turnout, for example. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Number one, you actually sometimes see a bump in voter turnout after a voter suppression measure has been enacted, where there's been a lot of media about it. There's a lot of organizing around it to try and target the communities that you know are going to be hit the most. And so the numbers may not show it. But what we do know is that when you have these suppressive election restrictions in year after year after year, they have an impact on the turnout and the way that people vote in these communities that have historically had barriers put up to block and to make it harder for them to vote. And the other thing we know that I think is really interesting and really important is that there's two, there's two things we know that are really interesting and really important. One is that voting is a habit. So political scientists who study this will tell you that if you show up to vote and there's a lot of issues and it's really hard, you are much less likely to come back again. If you show up and it's, you know, very easy, very user-friendly process, you're much more likely to do it again. And this is, becomes very, very crucial when you're looking at, for example, the fact that in a lot of jurisdictions, the parts of the state that have heavily minority communities have incredibly long lines. And then parts of the state that have mostly white voting communities, you pull up, you walk in, you cast your ballot, you walk out. Those are wildly different experiences that over time are going to have wildly different impacts on voter turnout and the way the communities interact with elections. The other thing is that when elections laws change, the people they hurt the most are the people who are living in either communities where there isn't a very long, strong history of voting and communication to, you know, to hear about the changes as they're happening. Because what we know is that people actually often learn about those changes, not necessarily from their elections officials, but from their neighbors. So I might hear from my neighbor, oh, you know, there's a primary going on and this year you need, I just went and voted and it turned out I needed my driver's license. Well, I know that now. If I'm, for example, a young person in a dorm in a state that I'm relatively new to, my neighbor is much less likely to know these things and I'm kind of flying blind. And there's all of these little pieces of knowledge that voters obtain through their interactions and history, not only with the voting process, but actually in their neighborhood. And voters who are less transient, who are more likely to live in a home that they own and live there for decades are much less likely to be disenfranchised All these little changes actually really have a serious impact over time and in the aggregate on more transient communities, communities that are more likely to rent, communities that are are less likely to have reliable sources of information about laws that are changing, less internet access, less likely to see something on Facebook, right? All of these things matter a lot. The January 6th Capitol insurrection obviously was a terrifying and sad I mean, you can use all of all of the superlatives that you want um, moment in our history. But the scarier part is what it means for our democracy going forward. What responsibility do lawyers have? And I mean, not just lawyers who are who are doing the kinds of work that, that you and your colleagues are doing every day, but in-house counsels, people that represent businesses. What role and responsibilities do lawyers have in protecting these democratic institutions going forward in the wake of the 2020 election and the Capitol insurrection? The attack on the Capitol was itself a culmination of, I think, frankly, decades of lies about exactly how American elections work and who's voting and and whether there's voter fraud or not. But of course, they were in the immediate aftermath of the big lie and Trump and his allies really pushing this idea that he'd lost the election. And and one thing that we saw that we'd never seen before was in the weeks after the election itself, 
we saw no less than 60 cases brought by Trump and his allies to try and discredit the election. None of those cases were successful over and over and over again. Courts found there was no evidence that they were based on absolutely like scurrilous lies, completely ridiculous theories, some of which involved Hugo Chavez and voting machines and all kinds of of things that just don't have any basis in reality. You then have the attack on the Capitol, which was terrifying. Thank God things did not go another way that day. But I think that what we all have to be aware of, all of us, is that we are still living in that historical moment. And in a way, I think what's even scarier right now is what we are seeing in response to both all of that litigation that we saw after the election that was unsuccessful and the attack on the Capitol. We are seeing in many, many, many states, in fact, 47 states introduced suppressive voter bills this cycle. And we already have lawsuits in Georgia, in Iowa, in Montana. I think next we'll see Florida probably within the next couple of days. Maybe by the time people hear this, it may have already happened. And several other states. And they are based on these same theories. And these are, are very, very scary bills. They are going to make it harder for lots of people to vote. They are, if they stay in place, they are going to fundamentally change a lot of the ways that elections are happening in these states and a lot of who can participate in them and who can't. In terms of what we can do about it, I think there tends to be a, sometimes a feeling among lawyers in particular that if they're not doing voting rights litigation, then there's not much they can do about it. And I think that's absolutely false. Obviously, like when elections are happening, volunteering to monitor at the polls and all of that kind of stuff is great. But actually, when elections aren't happening, lawyers are, you know, they're corporate counsel, they are in-house counsel, they are working with businesses, they are working in the communities, they are respected members of their communities. And at this point, all of us have an obligation to speak up and to push back and to say, this is not what our nation is. This is not how our democracy is supposed to work. It is far past, I think, the time when we, any of us, can afford or justify, frankly, looking away from it. And I think one of the things that we are seeing is that state legislatures that are inclined to pass these kinds of voter restrictions, they don't really hear the civil rights communities in the same ways anymore. I mean, they are just like hell bent on doing this. And it's, don't get me wrong, it's super important, all the work that all voting rights organizations and groups that have been doing this work forever are doing, that's super important work and everyone should continue doing it. But the business community and lawyers who work in other areas of the law, not just voting rights, who work with businesses, need to also back them up. They need to step into the fight. They need to start saying, look, this is unacceptable. We need to think about making decisions about political contributions. And we also need to start making other kinds of business decisions. And I think that is fundamentally, it is hugely important. At the end of the day, it is something that I think has been lacking and that we're now starting to see, you know, Patagonia is a great example. They really stepped out in front of this and I think are being a real thought leader in this way, but it is no longer a time to sit on the sidelines. This impacts all of us. And frankly, a lot of lawyers who work in business, the best thing that they can do is work in the channels in which they already work to make this a priority, to help their clients find the way to navigate this, to make sure they're on the right side of this. And I think support, you know, all the civil rights organizations and and all the voting rights organizations that have been doing this work for years. Liz Frost is a partner at global law firm Perkins Coie. She recently joined the law school for a special panel event on the rule of law and the 2021 presidential transition. You can learn more about her work, find more information about what we discussed today, and you can check out upcoming events like this one at UW Law over on our podcast page at law.uw.edu. Liz, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure. Discovery is hosted by John Blumster and produced by Greg Olson. Additional voiceover work by Ben Gonio with original music by John Blumster. 
Discovery is recorded in William H. Gates Hall at the University of Washington School of Law in Seattle with the support of Mario L. Barnes, the Tony Rempe Dean. For more, visit law.uw.edu.